Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to wait just a second here and let everyone file in. The numbers are going up here on the side for us. Uh, and then we'll get started with our program. Hey, guys, sorry, here. No, no problem, no problem. And our audience is, uh, has uh, joined us as well. Uh, you're hearing the voice of one of our uh, marketing uh, extraordinaires here. Um, we haven't started the program yet, Jenna, so you're, you're totally fine. Then uh, people are still filing in. We just don't want anyone to miss anything as we start. Yeah, the numbers are still Jenna's, going up. Jenna's going to give the lecture, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody wants that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it looks like we're holding steady, I think, for right now. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. Again, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Leon. I'm the manager of digital services at the Mar Mariners Museum and Park. Uh, if you've joined us before in the past, you've actually seen um, one of our team members, Tim, uh, who's just working on uh, with another program today. We have a lot of programs going on and we definitely invite you guys to check them out. If you go to our website, uh, you can actually see information about all sorts of programs coming up. Um, uh, not just our Civil War lecture series. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to John Corstein, who's going to talk us through uh, some information about the Roanoke. Okay, thank you very much, Leon. And <clears throat> of course, I'm John Corstein, uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum at Park. And we've developed these online uh, Zoom lectures where I can talk about various aspects of the American Civil War at sea. Um, I have tons of topics I'm going to give in the future, um, which you can uh, check out. Uh, I also write a blog on every program. So if you wish, you can find more technical detail information about the USS Roanoke. And that may make you understand that it was a ship of the future and yet in both iterations, it is a failure. Wow, that's hard to believe that a ship exists like that. Well, uh, as you see, um, the USS Roanoke was a Merrimack class steam screw frigate. Um, it was going to be built at uh, Gosport Navy Yard. And I just wanna say, when uh, the war broke out, the Roanoke was a very critical vessel for the Union to establish its blockade. And uh, however, um, after the Battle of Ironclads, they're going to figure out that since this is a Merrimack class vessel, that they can try to make an ironclad out of it themselves, just like the Confederates did. So anyway, the USS Roanoke is named for the Roanoke River in North Carolina. Uh, as I said, it's a Merrimack class um, steam screw frigate, and it was laid down at Gosport Navy Yard over in Portsmouth, Virginia, which is now the Norfolk Navy Yard. Um, and it was laid down in May of 1854. However, when it was launched right to a huge crowd, everyone's cheering, you know, this is a very important thing. And as the Roanoke slid down the ways, it immediately sank. So that's not a very good start for a vessel's career. Nevertheless, they raised her and they completed building the ship. Now I gotta tell you, um, this vessel is gonna be 263.8 feet in length. It's got a 52.6 foot beam. It's got a draft of 23.9 feet. Now, I have to tell you right now, one of the problems with every one of the Merrimack class vessels is that it has such a deep draft. In fact, this ship cannot go into most American ports because of its draft. So that's a huge problem. Uh, it could make 8.8 .8 knots at sea steam only. Uh, it can make 18.5 knots with, um, you know, just using its sails. Now, one of the odd things about this class of vessel, uh, I'm gonna get to in just a moment. I'm gonna let you know that it took 674 people to operate this vessel and that it actually has a very powerful armament, one 10 inch Dahlgren pivot gun, 
uh, two 12 pounder uh, smooth bores uh, that were actually howitzers that were there to repel boil, uh, borders. And then it had a complement of 28 nine inch shell guns and then 14 eight inch shell guns. So as an integrated battery, most of them are shell guns, which we already know are destructive to wooden warships. And we'll learn how bad that is already. While this ship is being built, the lessons being learned in the Black Sea and during the Crimean War are gonna tell us these ships are outdated. Anyway, um, likewise, beyond its armament, um, it was really, see the trouble is John Lentall, who was the designer of this vessel, um, he actually uh, would, um, uh, he, he, he used to build sailing ships. So he has a much sheer hull on all of the Merrimack class vessels so that they can operate mostly under sail. The steam powered unit is going to be really auxiliary. It to get you in and out of port. It's in case you have a battle, um, you can move in the position where you want to. Um, so uh, believe it or not, the Roanoke could put out almost 49,000 feet of canvas and its engine could only produce 849 horsepower. So in other words, and much of that gets dissipated uh, going down the propeller shaft to the propeller. Now I gotta tell you, it just took 103 horsepower just to start this engine. This is uh, the friction uh, from the propeller shaft, the poor mounts, made it um, problematic to operate under steam. Now, I gotta tell you, as a screw propeller, this is really critical. The screw, screw propeller was invented by John Erickson, as we know. Um, a man in the United States, Robert Griffiths, comes up with a system for our new steam screw frigates and sloops. And it's a hoist system. He has a very narrow blade, twin blade design um, that when you're under sail, you can fit it into a socket with an automatic pitch gear to uh, uh, increase the velocity. Now, um, I have to say that uh, they would be fitted behind when under sail only the stern post, but they also had uh, what is called a banjo, which was a device that could pull the propeller out of the water so that there was no drag under sail. And so that's continued proof that the Roanoke was built uh, for, as a sailing ship, secondary steamship. Now the Roanoke is gonna be commissioned under great fanfare on May 4th, 1857. Uh, Captain John B. Montgomery, a hero of the War of 1812, a hero of the Mexican War, uh, will become captain of the one of the, mo well, the most modern ship in the U.S. Navy. And uh, actually Montgomery's greatness is that he, fights at the Battle of Lake Erie on September 13th, 1813, and his gallant service earned him a sword, a gold sword from Congress and the thanks of Congress. So he's a pretty groovy dude. He liked to wear the sword, although we don't see it on him here. Um, he will play an important part in the, during the Mexican War in the operations along uh, Alta, California, the conquest of uh, Upper California, and then also the conquest of the Baja California Peninsula. Now, the big thing is, is that um, he, uh, um, I've got to say, uh, is used to sailing ships. Um, however, uh, the first duty of the Roanoke, as soon as it's launched, it is to go down to what is now known as Panama. Now, this is, these are the uh, shell guns. This is a nine inch shell gun used in, in seacoast fortification, but also on the Merrimack. Now, I got to tell you, under the overall command of Flag Officer Hiram Paulding, here you go, 
He kind of exceeds his orders, and they take the Roanoke to pick up this guy. And this guy is, is actually William Walker. And William Walker is called a filibuster. Now, a filibuster, now he's been a newspaper editor. Um, he actually uh, thought that um, uh, he, that, you know, part of the manifest destiny. Now, we've talked about the manifest destiny before when we discussed the USS Mississippi. But in his view, as well as in the view of many other Southerns like him, that they felt that you know, the Anglo-Saxons, English language, Protestant religion should take over um, all of Central America and Mexico. In fact, he came up with a scheme to take over Nicaragua. He names himself president. He proclaims that Nicaragua is now going to have slavery. See, he's part of the pro-enslavers that are trying to find ways to expand slavery in the United States. His idea is to take Nicaragua and eventually make it a state in the United States, just like he tried to do previously at uh, Sonora. So anyway, he is defeated and overthrown in 1857. So the first voyage of the Roanoke is to what is known as Aspenwald, Columbia, now known as Colón, Panama. That's another big story. And so um, he, they will pick him up. Hiram Paulding will be court-martialed for being involved with Walker, and he'll be sent out of the Navy for two and a half years. So um, he comes back to be important in the Civil War. So anyway, that's William Walker and the filibuster movement. Now, I got to tell you that... Um, uh, then, as soon as the Roanoke goes back to America with William Walker, guess what? They put the ship in ordinary at Charlestown Navy Yard in Boston. Why do they do that? Well, because there are problems with these ships. They roll excessively, so they're not a good gun platform. And furthermore, they are, um, the steam engines do not work well. And they never make the power that they're supposed to make at first. And so the Roanoke comes out of ordinary to go back to Aspenwall to transport the Japanese delegation to America. He brings them to Hampton Roads. The draft is too great to go up to Washington. So they send it back to Charlestown Navy Yard and place it in ordinary. Oh my gosh, this is um, a pretty bad vibe. So what's going to happen is that the Civil War breaks out. As you know, Lincoln proclaims a blockade of the southern coastline, and he needs every steam-powered ship to enforce that blockade. The U.S. Navy has 93 warships. However, half of those are rotten hulks like the Raritan at Gosport Navy Yard, uh, the Pennsylvania at Gosport Navy Yard, and only 28 steamers. And uh, steamers are so critical to the uh, you know, future of Navy. So uh, basically, they bring the Roanoke back into service under the command of Captain John Marsden. Now, Marsden had served in the U.S. Navy since the War of 1812. Uh, gosh, he actually he got to work with Fontaine Mari. He met the Marquis de Lafayette. He actually met Lord Byron. I mean, he was, at the beginning of the Civil War, commandant of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Now, basically, as soon as they can get this ship working in June, they will then, after we fit her out, they then take her down to the coast of South Carolina en route. Um, she is going to capture the blockade runner Mary off of Lockwood Inlet, North Carolina. She's going to capture the Avion Alert and Thomas Watson off Charleston. However, the Roanoke's deep draft and troublesome engines is going to see her sent to a Hampton Roads. She's going to be stationed off of Hampton Roads, uh, or in Hampton Roads, right off Fort Monroe. Um, she's joined with a powerful squadron. 
uh, that includes the USS Minnesota, 47 gun steam crew frigate, um, the 52 gun uh, sailing frigate, the St. Lawrence, the 50 gun sailing frigate, the Congress, and the 24 gun sailing sloop of war, the Cumberland. And they're blockading the James River and also waiting for the emergence of the Merrimack. Now remember, the Merrimack had been um, a steam crew frigate and had been burned at Gosport Navy Yard. However, the burning had not been very successful. And as a result of that, the Confederates are able to raise her, cut her down to her birth deck and turn her into a casemated ironclad. So uh, there's a big problem because everybody, there, there's no secrecy. I'm gonna do a program in the future about uh, naval intelligence during the Civil War. And I gotta tell you, no secrets are had. The Lynchburg, Virginia announces after the capture of Gosport Navy Yard that we've captured enough material to build a fleet of ironclad ships. This is in June of 1861. Federals recognize what's going on. And so they're gonna start building their own ironclads. Now, when 1862 dawns, the Roanoke, is going to suffer from an acute um, uh, lack of veteran seamen. Um, and also the engine system of the Roanoke um, required extensive repair because her craft, her, her crank, her shaft, is the supports are broken and the propeller is cracked. So as one person said, um, Marsden. When I think of the ship's crippled condition, no engine, 180 of her crew deficient, it makes me sick at heart. One of his seamen on board will say, lament, that it makes me sick at heart. We sailors couldn't understand why the government would leave such a powerful ship in a condition like this. All these ships are going to be needed in Hampton Roads because rumors of the Merrimack emerging persist from December all the way through the beginning of March. This man is the commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, Louis Nashibrez Goldsboro, five foot ten. 340 pounds, he doesn't do anything quickly. Uh, however, um, as we'll learn, uh, he will actually know that that Merrimack and properly known as the CSS Virginia, but the Federals always call it the Merrimack, he knew it was going to come out sometime soon. So when he goes with uh, Brigadier General Ambrose Everett Burnside to capture Roanoke Island, North Carolina, he leaves John Marston in command of the squadron in Hampton Roads. And he, both Marston and Goldsboro talk about it. They knew only by excessive pounding could perhaps they break um, the iron protection of the Merrimack. Now, uh, nothing, I think, said Goldsboro, but very close work can be of service in accomplishing the destruction of the Merrimack and even of that, a great deal may be necessary. Now, news of the impending attack had been rife throughout Hampton Roads. And so what Marsden did was set several armed tugs, like the USS Zouave, USS Young America, USS Dragon, positioned at Newport News Point and near Fort Monroe. In fact, they have to tow the sailing ships into action. No one knows what the, uh, as they would say, Merrimack was going to do when she emerged from the um, Elizabeth River. So Marsden says, well, I'm, I wish she would come because we're tired of hearing about her and I'm anxiously expecting her and I believe I am ready. Well, who could be ready for the CSS Virginia? Cut down from the screw... Um, steamship Merrimack. He is a powerful ironclad with two layers of iron plate atop 20 um, inches of oak, white pine, yellow pine backing. 
She has a ram. Uh, she also is the future of navies. And on March 8th, she emerges from the Elizabeth River. And so right away, all these steamers, and she heads, first the channel takes her, because she's got a draft of 22 feet. She her, takes her towards Fort Monroe, and then she turns towards Newport News Point, where she's going to attack the Congress and Cumberland. Marsden immediately gets his ships underway. Now, the big problem is that as they move forward, the Minnesota is uh, uh, going to actually run into the, what is known as Newport News Bar, stuck hard aground. Tugs can't get her off. The next coming along is going to be Marsden's ship. However, he tries to take a wider move around Newport News Bar, and he, with the support of the armed tug, the USS Whitehall, is going to run aground on Middle Ground Shoal. Um, the Monitor Merrimack Bridge actually crosses right next to that shoal where the lighthouse is. Anyway, so what's going to happen is, is that they watch... The St. Lawrence is going to be towed into action, but that vessel also runs aground on Newport News Bar. They are helpless as they watch the Virginia ram and sink the USS Cumberland and then bombard into submission and set afire the USS Congress. Somehow, during all this, the Roanoke gets pulled off the Middle Ground Shoal and heads back to Fort Monroe because Marston think I might be the only ship that can stop the Virginia from, or Merrimack to from getting into the Middle Ground, uh, out into the Chesapeake Bay. Meanwhile, the, Vir the Virginia will come back into Hampton Roads after sinking Congress and Cumberland. They shell the Minnesota, and the uh, St. Lawrence, and as a result of that, oh my gosh, it looks like the Confederacy is done for. Consequently, we're gonna realize that uh, everybody is fearful of what the Confederacy might do. However, like a miracle, under the eerie light of the burning Congress, um, shrouding across Hampton Roads. In comes the USS Monitor, and, and the Monitor pulls under the command of Lieutenant John Lone Warden, pulls up next to the Roanoke, because John Marsden is the station commander, and says, hey, we're the Monitor. Uh, I think you're expecting us. And Marsden says, oh, thank goodness that you're here. However, he also says, look, I have a telegram here that says I'm to send you to um, Washington. But I think the best defense of Washington is right here in Hampton Roads. So go next to the Minnesota and save her if you can. Marsden, uh, of course, will uh, uh, watch the next day as the monitor holds off the Confederate ironclad, they fight the famous Battle of Hampton Roads, March 9th, 1862, and it's a drawn battle. For the next uh, almost two months, the two ships will kind of look at each other, and there's a stalemate in Hampton Roads. The James River is closed. Now, I got to tell you, the Federals, although they're building ironclads on the East Coast, the Galena, and also the new Ironsides, they know they need more ironclads. They knew that only with a great deal of ironclads can they counter the menace of Confederate ironclads. So John Lentall, the very guy who designed the original Merrimack class, is going to say, hey, he works with John Isherwood and said, hey, why don't, why don't we change the Roanoke so that it can be transformed into an ironclad. They said, well, the Confederates did that with the Merrimack. Why can't we do it with the uh, Roanoke? So they take, um, uh, you know, they take the Roanoke up to Brooklyn Navy Yard and they begin to create her transition. Um, basically Gideon Wells says, this is a great idea. 
We need more ironclads, and it will arrive at the Brooklyn Navy Yard on March 25th, 1862, and begin its uh, conversion. Now, I want you to note this uh, image I've shown before you, and these are not the original plans, but they are a survey done of the Roanoke in 1874. And what shows you the most from this view is that it is the first ship that is going to have three center line turrets. Oh my gosh. So how are they gonna make this into an ironclad? Well, number one, they wanna have four turrets, but there's too much weight. And so what they do is they use Passaic class turrets. There you go. And they will put three on the Roanoke. Um, now these are protected by 11 layers of one inch iron plate. And so they also have stationary pilot houses on top, two of them in the case of the Roanoke. Wow, I gotta tell you, the original plan, now they cut the ship down to the gun deck. And as a result of that, they will have a six foot freeboard, which will, uh, plans are to really cover it with uh, six layers of one inch iron plate. And all of a sudden they go, oh my gosh, and that's too much weight. And so Novelty Ironworks will install a single 4.5 inch iron plate that will taper down to 3.5 inch iron plate as you go down through the hull. Uh, so the deck armor was supposed to be 2.5 inches, but uh, too much weight once again. And so there's a big problem. So they uh, are unable to have deck armor other than 1.5 inches. The Roanoke right away has really serious flaws, I got to tell you. Um, it was a heavy ship. Now, just think, each one of these turrets weigh 127 tons. Added to that weight, the Roanoke is going to have the finest naval armament that the federal government could provide. In other words, they have, you know, uh, uh, 15 inch Dahlgrens, they got 11 inch Dahlgrens, and they got 150 pounder pairs. So let me just tell you what the weight are. A 15 inch Dahlgren weighs 43,000 pounds. There are two of them on the Roanoke. Then an 11 inch Dahlgren weighs 16,000 pounds. And a 150 pounder Parrot gun weighs 16,300 pounds. This entire load, now remember they're building it on a wooden ship frame. This entire load is going to be supported with iron stanches beneath the area of the turret, which then takes the weight down to the hull. The trouble is the hull is made of wood and because it's made of wood, it is uh, not able to really support all that weight. So the Roanoke's gonna suffer from hogging right away. The excessive weight is gonna actually cause the ship to start leaking immediately. Well, and you've got this problem that we have created a ironclad whose draft can only operate in several places. And so the Roanoke, is going to eventually be assigned as a guard ship in Hampton Roads. Why is this? <coughs> well, I'm gonna tell you. Right now, um, the Roanoke has the most, as I said, the most powerful armament uh, that anybody knows in the world. Uh, this is a great uh, painting of the um, Roanoke done during the Civil War. You can see the Passaic class turrets. Uh, now, just think, uh, 401's got a 15-inch Dahlgren and a 150-pounder Barrett. Then the middle turret has two 11-inch Dahlgrens. The rear turret has a 150-pounder Parrot and a 15-inch Dahlgren. No ship, right, in the Confederate Navy could withstand what this ship could do. Plus, 
they build a ram that extends 4.5 feet um, that is in an axe-like design. So this is a dangerous ship. Why isn't it a success? Well, I'm gonna tell you right now. She gets commissioned in 1865, and this is, of course, Admiral Dahlgren, inventor of the Dahlgren gun. That's a Dahlgren rifle behind him. This man, Benjamin Sands, is going to be the first commander of the uh, USS Roanoke as an ironclad. Now, he had served in the Mexican War. Um, he was going to be detailed to uh, the Roanoke, and he takes it on its first voyage. And that first voyage is only going, is actually going to be a shakedown cruise. And this shakedown cruise is going to say a couple of things. Number one, that the ship could make eight knots, 8.8 .8 knots. It could only, but it could cruise at seven knots. Then he, Sands, will write, oh my gosh, this ship roll is so great that it will be impossible to fight its guns. And uh, at one time, they test the guns when they make it into Hampton Roads. And one 15-inch gun falls off of its carriage from the fierce recoil. At the same time, a 150-pounder parrot falls off of its carriage. Now, just imagine if you're in the turret when that happens. So, the, so this violent recoil makes it very problematic. Now, I got to say that um, Sands is going to be replaced by this man, Gert. Gander's boat. Um, this is a young picture of him. However, he was from a very aristocratic Dutch American family. His father was a brigadier general in the U.S. Army. Uh, he joins the U.S. Navy in 1823. I'll uh, tell you what, perhaps most of the notable events of his career is that he was on board the USS Summers when the Summers mutiny took place. The commander of the Summers is going to be uh, Alexander uh, McKenzie, uh, uh, Seidel McKenzie. He takes on McKenzie because he gets his big inheritance. And so actually the son of the Secretary of War, Philip Spencer, plans a mutiny and it gets taken out. And as First Lieutenant Gandersvort says, looky here. These guys need to be punished. And so um, Spencer and two of his co-conspirators are going to be hanged from the deck. You can see in this picture, there are the bodies hanging right beneath the flag. That's what happens to a mutiny. Well, I got to tell you, Gandervoort does not do much with the uh, um, Roanoke. There's not much you can do. This is a style, stylized image of it. But I want you, we're going to remember this picture because I think this is extremely important. The final captain of the ship is going to be a man known as Augustus Henry Kilty, and he actually will serve as commander of this ship, the Mound City, one of the first ironclads in the Mississippi. In fact, while operating in 1863 in the Arkansas River, uh, he's up there in that pilot house, and a shell hits it and he loses his left arm. Well, um, he's not very good. Uh, you know, he recovers and he is given this command. Now, I have to tell you that the ironclad, uh, I want you to all, well, we're gonna come back to that view again. So it's gonna be after the war's end, it goes back up to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, placed in ordinary. Its only real service is going to be as this man, um, Rear Admiral Stephen Rowan is going to be Fleet Admiral of New York, and he uses the Roanoke as his flagship. Well, I got to tell you, uh, that's not smart to do, uh, because you see, right now we have, now this is without any guns, but the Roanoke uh, is riding a little high. Remember, it's only got six feet of freeboard. But one of the big things of the ship is the center line turrets. If you look at this picture and start to compare it 
to warships that are going to be built in 1880s, the pre-dreadnought class, they go away from having sails and they go to inline turrets. So this is a failure for civil warships in every component as a wooden ship, as an ironclad, but it is a precursor of what iron and actually steel warships are going to look like. So anyway, that is the story of the Roanoke. I always talk too long, but I got to tell you, um, if you have any questions, you can uh, uh, not only put them in the chat box here, but you can also email me. My email is up. Um, you can learn more about the Roanoke uh, by um, actually um, uh, going on to marinersmuseum.org. Go to our blogs, and we have Civil War blogs, and I write them. And so we have a detailed story. I mean, if you think this was long. If I read my blog of 4,000 words, it's a lot longer. So anyway, um, I want to thank you for participating in today's program. Uh, once again, my name is John Korstein. I'm Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum at Park, and I look forward to your questions now. Um, thank you. All right, John. It looks like we've got a couple questions. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, so our first question is actually from uh, Lauren. Uh, did the designers improve the steam power plant of the Roanoke to make up for the extra weight when it was modified? No, they did not, uh, because they took into account the, um, just the removal of sails and upper works so they could try to make this, the ship um, stable at sea. Uh, but the mere design of the sheer hull wouldn't let that be. When it goes to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, just like they did with the Merrimax conversion to the Virginia, they are going to rebuild this engine, trying to, you know, they re-support the propeller shaft in a much better way to stop shaking, and uh, they get rid of the banjo, they get rid of the hoist device, uh, they get rid of the socket device, to because it's no longer a sailing ship. It is a steamship. Uh, but the problem is, is that the engines actually work very well uh, when um, it's brought by uh, Captain Sands down to Hampton Roads. They note it makes 8.8 .8 knots and could cruise at seven knots without any problems. So the engines didn't overheat anymore. There was not any more slippage. And the slippage in part is because of how they um, supported or braced the engine. The sad thing about the Roanoke, Lauren, is that they could not brace all the weight of the deck and the turrets other than the stanchions, and that went down to the hull. They needed to do, um, instead of hog chains, they needed to put in iron bars that held the ship together in a diagonal fashion uh, throughout the hull of the ship. Okay, I think that answers your question. Next. All right, we've got a few more questions here and I wanna go ahead and remind everyone that if you would like to speak uh, with your microphone to John, um, all you have to do is press the raise your hand button uh, in your Zoom interface and we'll know to unmute you. Um, but moving on to some of our typed in questions, uh, we've got quite a few here. Uh, Julianne is asking, how many were in the Roanoke crew and where did they live while on board? Ah, well. When they, this, I guess you're asking about the cut down version. And so the original version, you had to have over 650 crew members. When they cut it down, they only cut it down to the um, gun deck so that they would create a better freeboard for the ship. So the berth deck is still there. So the reconfigured Roanoke needs 350 men to operate the ship. And I have to tell you that they have quarters just like anybody else would have had uh, uh, on a steam screw frigate. So um, they uh, had a birth deck to, you know, to um, live on and that sort of stuff. Okay, next. Did 
Hello. Can you hear me now, John? Yes, I can now. Okay, Thank sorry. Uh, Julianne also asked one more question. Uh, what did Billy Budd and Melville have to do with this story? Oh my gosh, I forgot to tell you. Well, I'm short of time. If you read my blog, I'm going to tell you. Uh, Gert um, Gandersvoort is actually cousin to Herman Melville. And so when, you know, and there is uh, Gert on board the Summers with a mutiny. So when he gets back home, because he goes on leave, he has to be part of the court martial proceedings. Uh, he actually, um, Melville will visit him and take down the story of the mutiny and the harshness of treatment of sailors at sea. And as a con, you know, the treatment was terrible. They used cat and nine tails and, you know, lash people for the slightest, um, slightest um, violation of the regulations. And so that cruel and inhuman treatment was uh, actually resented by the crew members. And so with the unrested or a, 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 an upset crew, Spencer takes advantage of it and forms a mutiny. So Herman Melville goes and sees his cousin, writes down the best essence of the story, and then he goes back and writes Billy Budd. I got to tell you, Melville did the very same thing to the um, uh, Moby Dick, because he interviews one of the survivors of the Essex, which was the most notable ship to be rammed by a whale and sunk. And there were very, I think, three survivors of the Essex. And so what Herman liked to do, especially if he knew these people, and, and so he'd go and talk to them. And Billy Budd is one of his greatest books that really illuminates the um, poor conditions that seamen had to endure during the pre-Civil War era. Okay, thanks for that question. All right, and we've actually got someone uh, with their hand raised here, and so I'm going to uh, call on um, Mr. Ed Flanagan here. Okay. Uh, Ed, you are, you are good to go. Oops. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, why didn't they use breech-loading cannons like the Winthworth Rifle Cannon? Okay. Well, um, the Whitworth did not have a, a, the extensive um, range and calibers that were offered by the Parrot guns. Parrot guns were built in the United States, and of course, John Paul Parrot at West Point Foundry had developed this banding technique. Um, the English, however, with their Armstrong guns, which are the guns that go on uh, the HMS Warrior, are going to be breech loading. The trouble is that breech, they hadn't really perfected the breech sealing mechanism. So there was um, some escape of gases when they would fire the gun. So actually, they'll remove all the breech loaders uh, or breech loaders off the Warrior and replace them with muzzle loaders. So it's going to take a little more time to perfect the breech loading systems, which once you have steel guns, it really makes it more effective. Um, I would have preferred having an Armstrong gun on my ship or a Brook gun uh, because they were triple, quadruple banded. Uh, Brook had up to three bands, which contained all the stress when you're trying to speed the shell out of the uh, interior of the cannon and all those gases have to be held in to send that shot spinning out at the enemy. The Parrot's gun um, was flawed in many ways because of the way in which um, the band was placed on the tube and was prone, especially in larger calibers, to bursting. In fact, most of the, other than the attack, at the attack of Fort Fisher, in the fleet itself, other than the 
um, Marine and Blue Jacket attack on Fort Fisher, most of the casualties were caused by the explosion of 100 pounder and 150 pounder parrots. So uh, the iron technology was not sufficient to make breech loading guns that actually um, were safe to use and efficient to use. So that's going to take a little more uh, improvements to um, the design and uh, protection of guns, which will happen by the 1880s. I hope that answers your question, Ed. All right, and we've got uh, just a few more uh, minutes left, but we do have uh, five more questions here, John. Uh, so Michael, Michael Werner, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, is asking how long was the, uh, the Roanoke in commission? In commission, it was 262 feet in length because of the way they cut it down. See, each one of the Merrimack class ships had a different length. They didn't really follow Lentall's plan perfectly. Uh, unless they were up at the uh, Charlestown Navy Yard. So uh, basically when they cut her down, they didn't really lose any length like they did when they cut down the Virginia because uh, they only cut it down to the gun deck versus the berth deck on the CSS Virginia. Okay. Uh, we've got a question here from Jeffrey Men uh, Mendonca. How long did the conversion take? The conversion took about um, 14 months. Um, number one, um, the engine system uh, took several weeks to rebuild. Then uh, Novelty Ironworks had to not only forge the plates, actually they used a secondary forge to help them with that. They also had to bend the plates because of just how the road note was. And they actually went through some fits and starts, especially with you know, all of a sudden they figured out, oh my gosh, we can't put four turrets on it. So it was a lengthy process actually, and um, will not be uh, um, able to uh, go into service until um, June of 1863. So it's a 14 month uh, conversion in essence. Does that make sense? Uh, I think it's um, recommissioned on June 29, 1863. So from March 26, 1862 to June 1863. Okay. And uh, we've got another one. Actually, this wasn't. Uh, oh, actually, I think we answered that one. Excuse me. Uh, Scott Boyd is asking How could professional naval officers and architects be responsible for such a design disaster? <laughs> and well, a follow up question is actually why not just use two turrets and reduce weight? Well, the idea of the problem with the monitor design was that uh, it had limited firepower. That's proved at the attack on uh, Charleston by DuPont in April 1863. So they wanted to increase the firepower. They recognized, based on the studies done by uh, Cowper Coles in Great Britain, that you could have a slightly lower freeboard that enables you to have two to four turrets. The trouble is Coles was wrong. And of course his premier ship, he uh, supervised the construction of <clears throat> the captain <clears throat> will sink in a storm, taking Coles with him in his concepts. So the trouble is we're trying to marry weight and with a wooden structure. And so they didn't take the, um, the considerations of what that weight would do to the hull and how you could dissipate that weight. Uh, so that's why it had three turrets, um, was to enhance its firepower. Um, it also, they said, look, look what they did with the Merrimack. So we're going to do the same with the Roanoke. They decided instead of a casemate to do a turreted ship. Uh, so you have a higher freeboard, all that is extra weight. And so that concept just doesn't work. It's going to take the production of steel hulled warships that are going to be able to withstand the weight because of their design and uh, uh, the system of stanchions and supports to, to handle these heavier 
turrets. Just think of the main, and you can see where they're going with the concept of the Roanoke. They made a mistake in using that wooden hull. But they thought if the Merrimack could be done, that the Union could do the same. So, um, uh, you know, in the United States, we hadn't really advanced, but to a certain extent, the concept of iron hull construction, which the English had introduced in the 1840s, we had started to do it, but, um, you know, they just did not consider, just like John Luke Porter made the mistake uh, when he cut down the Merrimack, he did, he took the wrong measurements. So actually the Virginia rode high in the water. So they had to put, you know, iron bars, Ketlich on board to lower in the water because of the way the shield protected it. There is no knuckle on the Roanoke. It, the sides are just plated right onto the um, wooden backing. So I hope that answers your question. All right. And actually, this last question will help us out with, uh, I think, signing off to, uh, today. Uh, Julianne is asking us uh, if you can let us know about your next lecture. Wow. My next lecture. I don't know if you all paid attention uh, to my lecture, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And that was on the sinking of the Hatteras. Well, the commander of that ship was the famous Raphael Sims. But he becomes famous during the Civil War, first because of the cruise of the CSS Sumter, um, which will be the first Confederate commerce raider. Uh, and um, so it's really, it's the start. Uh, I mean, Raphael Simmons was in the US Navy. He also um, took a leave of absence to become a lawyer. I don't want to take away from my next program, but he uh, uh, will actually become famous because of what he does with the Sumter, which leads to him having the command of the CSS Alabama. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the story about um, the uh, Sumter, and then I'm going to do one about uh, the cruise and the demise of the CSS Alabama. So that's going to be in the future. Uh, uh, if you have any suggestions for other programs you wish for me to do, I'm scheduled all the way through March. However, I'd be very happy to um, listen to you all and hear what you want me to write about and talk about. You can learn more about the sinking of the Hatteras, more about the Roanoke uh, in my blogs that are found at um, AmeriCanMuseum.org. And I, I footnote everything painstakingly so that um, you can learn more about the failure of construction of the Roanoke by reading that blog and also what was wrong with the engine system. And uh, just like they fixed the engine system on the Merrimack, they did the same with the Roanoke. Uh, so anyway, uh, without further ado, I want to thank you all for participating in our program today. Um, it's always a pleasure to share stories about the Civil War at Sea with y'all. Once again, you can email me. My email address is there. Um, you can read my blog. You can see this program later on the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, and also, I have done, I don't know, how many have I done, Liana? A whole bunch of so, um, that's a good question uh, yeah. next time that you uh, do a program we'll actually say the number uh, by this point yeah. I don't know <laughs> I've been doing them since what end of March so uh, yes oh my god <laughs> so anyway thank you all and thank you Leon for hosting the program all right everyone we'll see you next time hope to see you all for the next Civil War lecture or any of our other lectures uh, there will be a survey at the end of this program please uh, fill that out everyone have a great afternoon Okay.